Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ESOP Sofa November edition. I'm Darren Smith of Global Shares, and I'm delighted for the opportunity to host the final virtual ESOP Sofa of 2021. And what a crazy year it's been. Unprecedented, some might say. I think I've heard that word used a few times. I need to give enormous thanks uh, to the FS Club sponsors, who without them we couldn't do these events, and also to the ESOP Centre members for your generous support. Um, a big thank you from me to my panellists today, giving up your own time and, uh, and sharing your expert views, and to Julia, who behind the scenes is working the slides and the tech, because basically I can't do two things at once, I can't lie to you. Uh, so today's panel will be discussing hot topics from recent editions of the ESOP, Centre's monthly news pad for about 25 minutes to 30 minutes, and then we'll move on to audience questions as well. So please do use the question facility in the menu bar on the top right hand side of your screen. Um, basically how it works is any tough questions I'll pass to the panel, any easy ones I'm quite happy to answer for you, not a problem at all. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and it will be available to view on the events page in approximately two working days. Um, the address will be in the chat bar as well. Okay. Right then, let's get on with it. Let's have a chat with this uh, uh, this belter of a panel. So first up, we have our EMI expert and lawyer, Colin Kendon of Bird and Bird. I'll be firing questions at Colin today like stones, but I hope in this instance, it doesn't kill two birds with one stone. I can't tell you how, how much I wanted to get that joke in, Colin. I apologise in advance. <laughs> no, no. No, no, that's fine, yes. <laughs> then we have our e uh, EOT expert and lawyer, Charlotte Fleck of Deloitte. EOTs to Charlotte is like a Depeche Mode single, she just can't get enough. And finally, yeah. what panel would be complete without a superstar of a plan issuer? Please welcome Lynn Collar for Wincanton, one of my faves, and also gives us another great accent from around the UK on our panel. So welcome to all the panellists. Um, enough from me, let's look at the hot topics since our last sofa in August. So much has happened, so much. There's been a budget, I think I blinked and missed it. The YBS fallout has caused the UK share plan providers to have the busiest Q3 and Q4 on record. That's according to Smith News, a very reliable source. Uh, employee ownership trusts are getting headlines and PE is killing off share plans apparently. When I mentioned this to my 11 year old son, he said PE is killing it off and you want me to do more fitness? Those are the headlines, everyone. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, without further ado go on to our wonderful panel. So, Lynn, first up, it'd be great to hear about what post lockdowns meant to you for your share plan. But first, can you just give us a little bit of an intro about Wincanton? Yeah, um, thanks for that, Darren. Um, Wincanton is a FTSE all share company, so we sit at around just uh, just over the four hundred um, limit. Um, slot in the uh, the FTSE index so we are um you know reliant on our shareholders and also you know our employees we've got 19,000 employees in the UK uh, we are UK based only but we do have a, a business in Ireland as well um, we are logistics um, so basically warehouses drivers um, anything really that's uh, making sure the supply chain works as it should do so those 19,000 people, obviously, are probably, um, you know, very, very important to us. Uh, lockdown for them has been business as usual, um, or even more business <laughs> than usual, um, because most of our customers are the likes of Sainsbury's, Asda, B&Q. Um, you know, they've had a massive, massive increase in their revenues over the lockdown period. So we've actually seen quite uh, a boost in our business. Profit hasn't followed, revenue's coming. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure those 19,000 keep you uh, very occupied then, Lynn, that sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so in terms of uh, your, your share plans then, um, what have you seen throughout the pandemic and, and, and I guess post lockdown? Well, I suppose, I mean, I mean we, the trouble is, I'll take you back a little bit of a step because I've been at Wincanton now for two years. Uh, when I joined Wincanton, we got a share incentive plan that hadn't been really launched properly. Um, it was sort of like, you know, a little bit, um, oh, you can have this if you want to, but I'm not going to tell you much about it. Um, the long term incentives, the exec plans were all on spreadsheets. Um, 
So we took a look at uh, what we um, wanted to offer to our, our, our um, colleagues um, and actually found that the provider wasn't particularly going to help us do all the things that we wanted to do. And in the meantime, we were looking at our registration um, contract as well. So at the beginning of this year, we moved across um, our share register alongside implementing a new uh, share plan provider. So we started that off just as we um, were coming out of lockdown this year. Now, at the same time, we started off a massive Oracle implementation uh, within the business. So we haven't had the chance yet. It's, we've moved everything over, everything's new with a new provider, can offer quite a lot more than our previous provider could do, but we haven't had the chance yet to relaunch the SIP, and that's what we really want to get on to now. Brilliant, so you've definitely been kept busy <laughs> during, the, during the pandemic then, moving register yeah, and share plan provider. Yeah, but I think it's important to have the right share plan provider behind you that can offer all of the things that you want to do, so Brilliant. we've got that well, now. Great stuff. Well, thank you very much for that, Wayne. Sounds really positive. Uh, you know, it's, it's 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 still going strong post pandemic. Um, so, I, I guess the next thing for me would be really to go on to to Colin. Um, we we talked, and, we, and I should say, I've read about the private equity companies killing off share plans. Do, do we need to worry about this? Is is this is this a real thing? Yeah, well, okay, so the reason why this is topical is uh, Morrison's, isn't it? They've got 118,000 employees and they're in a share save plan. Uh, and it, it's, they, they, it's very likely they're going to be taken over by a PE house. Um, so you know, the immediate consequence for participants is very good because it'll be a uplift in the share price and they'll be able to sell their exercise options and sell their shares at quite a premium to what it was trading at before uh, the bid. Um, uh, but then after that, of course, um, what happens then? Uh, and it, you know, PE houses are um, one of the unfortunate consequences of the way the uh, tax qualifying legislation is structured. Is you've got to be an independent company, uh, or the issue of the shares used have got to be an issuing company which is listed on a recognised stock exchange. And after the PEs have taken over, those conditions won't be met, so they won't be able, if they were minded to, to offer a share save plan or indeed any other tax qualifying plan. Um, and it's not as if I mean, these PEs, what, what they want to do is uh, fatten up the company and sell it on as a profit and, you know, they don't want to run down the business and they would, I'm sure, want to motivate employees and not just management but staff as well. So it's very frustrating that they can't do it in a tax efficient um, way. Uh, and I think probably the best they can do is cash bonuses because at least you get a corporation tax deduction for those and they're simple to operate. Um, I, I've acted for companies that have been um, PE. Uh, owned before and we have put in incentive plans for management and when we do that they're typically growth shares but they, growth shares don't lend themselves very easily to uh, all employee plans because most employees don't do tax returns they don't want to take the risk they're complicated to explain uh, so you, you, you end up having to do a cash bonus plan which is a lot more costly to do you know and one of the ways of cutting that cost is to make it a less generous plan which would be unfortunate for Morrison staff until such time as they ever they're they're finally listed and sold and you know the PE's exit. No, oh, brilliant. No, I'll, I'll make sense there, Colin. Really, really clear. Uh, I think from a from a provider point of view, in terms of you know share plans slowing down, we're we're seeing it continually grow, especially with more inclusivity around the world globally, wanting to include lots. You know, whether you've got ten people or a thousand people. Um, we were seeing lots more taking discretionary share plans away from spreadsheets, uh, like you just said earlier, Lynn, and, and you know, taking it onto platforms. Um, and we're seeing emerging companies taking cap tables off spreadsheets and putting them into uh, you know, EMIs and having it on a portal as well. So we're definitely seeing lots and lots of share plans still going out there. So I, I think we'll still be okay for a job, all of us, fortunately. Um, so thanks for that, Colin. I think ne next uh, big topic was EOTs. Uh, I've read a lot about these, Charles, and I, I can't say that I'm an expert. I don't want to lie to you, so that's why you know we, we bring you on here. I wonder if you could quickly explain for the audience what an EOT is, please. No problem. And um, as mentioned, Aaron, I'm sorry you don't have tax to get you up in the morning. But um, <laughs> an EOT, so it's an employee ownership trust. That's more or less what it says on the tin. Um, a trust that holds the majority of a company for the benefit of all of its employees. 
Um, that is for the benefit of all employees. And while they don't hold the shares directly, the trustee has to act in their interest. So it's a pretty great deal for employees. Um, there's a couple of tax reliefs, which are going to be quite relevant. Um, there's a relief for paying bonuses to all employees, which is nice. There's also complete relief from capital gains tax when you sell your company to an EOT. Um, that's obviously quite motivating for a lot of sellers, and especially I think with the um, restrictions on what was entrepreneurs relief, um, now business asset disposal relief. Um, it means that um, when people are looking at an exit, um, the tax benefits of an EOT tend to be quite striking to them. Brilliant. So I guess a big question raised in the latest news pad was, are EOTs being used for tax avoidance? Mm. Yeah, and it's a really that? great question because I think firstly, um, there are definitely sellers out there who see the completely free of CGT and are like, where do I sign up? And that's, it's not avoidance if they're um, incentivized by a tax relief that's operating exactly the way it should. Um, the whole reason the government put it in the legislation is as a kind of carrot to try and promote employee ownership. So in that sense, it's completely doing its job. Um, what I will say we're seeing a bit is um, sellers who, OK, they've um, seen the tax relief. But what I'd say is that once you've um, it's got your attention, an EOT is a long term structure. It's quite subject to some points I'm going to make in a bit. It's quite hard to sell out of an EOT without some um, a bit of a nasty sting in a tail in terms of future tax charges. Um, it's not something you do if you're thinking, oh, well, we're going to go on and have a bigger exit in five years. Um, that's just not a good idea. And I think there are some people who and so, won't name any advisors, obviously, but um, some of them are sort of looking at that CGT really thinking, oh, well, we'll do the sale now and not thinking of how it will work for them in the long term. And I think there is a very small minority of um, EOTs that are being done purely as avoidance schemes in the sense of you sell into an EOT, you get the tax relief, you wait two years for the um, for the clawback charges to fall away, um, and then you just sell on to the company you wanted to sell to in the first place. You basically just flipped the company, no real benefit to employees, um, but quite a lot of tax relief for the vendors. And I do think that probably does count as tax avoidance. Right. Uh, and then I believe there's some proposed changes to this legislation. Mm -hmm. Are they needed and, and will they work? Yeah. So that was last month's news pad, which I think um, was quite exciting for all of us. Um, good to have a little bit of controversy. But um, I do think the um, COT, CIOT's ideas are good ones. Um, I think that um, preventing EOTs from being located offshore um, would do a lot to stop companies just being flipped because while well, there's some great offshore trustees out there and we've definitely seen EOTs set up with an offshore trustee just because that's where the expertise is. You know, these are professional fiduciaries, they know their job. Um, I do think the fact that you can then sell with the trustee not paying any CGT because they're not UK resident, um, it does... Um, attract a certain level of ingenuity from advisors at times. Um, and most of the good professional trustees, the bigger firms do have branches um, in the UK. So you, you can still have the benefit of that expertise without going offshore in most cases. Um, the other thing the CIAT recommended, which I don't think I've seen talked about as much, is um, preventing vendors from being a majority of the trustee board. For example, you set up a little subsidiary to act as your EAT trustee. Um, but the people on the board of that trustee are all the pe same people who were on the board of the company and owned the company and were the sellers. And I've seen that done in some cases just because, you know, the company, they do genuinely want to be employee owned, but there's a bit of a transition. They don't feel like their employees have the expertise and knowledge yet. Being a trustee is a big responsibility. And they think that as a transitional thing while they train some employees up. And that makes sense. But if the company then has, you know, when you sell to an EOT, it's normally a bit like an earn out. Um, there's money that's left outstanding to the vendors paid off out of future profits. And if the vendors get an offer for the company and it's a good offer and it would pay off their future and it would pay off their outstanding consideration, even if it wouldn't do much for the employees, that's a really difficult position for them to be in. And so I think that um, 
preventing vendors from being in that position sometimes naively would be um, a useful step um, in order to again prevent that situation where a company is just being flipped. Brilliant. No, thanks for that, Charles. And if, if anyone's got any questions they want to ask around that, feel free to put it in the question box. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back more to my comfort, comfort zone now, Charlotte, and, and go back to uh, <laughs> go back to Lynn. But thanks for that really good stuff. That, you know, it's uh, very interesting, and um, you, you've explained it clearly for me. So that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll, we'll go back to Lynn now. Lynn, you mentioned you've um, you've got a stick for your employees. You're looking at relaunching it. Uh, would you be able to give us some stats on on take up of that, and um, you know what yeah. you think you could help drive more? engagement yeah i think i mean we've got quite a bit that we want to do around this so at the moment we've only got about a 10 percent take up which is very disappointing to us um i did manage to push it with the senior management group before we started the oracle uh, implementation so we have got quite a number of our senior managers in there now but it is an all employee scheme as, as you know it's, as Sharon said, his plans need to be. Um, so what we really want to do now is 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 get take that plan and, and really give it a good old relaunch. So we're thinking about um, targeted uh, communications to individuals, either electronically or um, or you know some of our employees we can't get to electronically because they're drivers and they warehouse staff. They don't sit in front of a computer, so actually getting communication to them is very difficult. So we're going to tackle that in a number of ways. We're going to um, we're going to write to people where we've got uh, all of their details. We, most of the time we have, but not guaranteed, because um, we take a lot of agency stuff in as well. Um, although those wouldn't be shared on people, but. Um, we're going to do posters, we're going to do table talkers, we're going to get out there to some of our bigger sites. Some of our larger sites could have 300 employees on, but they also work in shifts. So, so again, trying to get that sort of like face-to-face -face communication going is very difficult. We also recognise that we've got a level of financial education to, to um, you know, really push with our employees. Obviously, our warehouse people are not the most highly paid um they're not the most financially aware um so we do need to do that financial education piece as well um and we see that as part of our social responsibility to you know as we're talking about things like compliance then esg becomes important the social piece of that um, under the s becomes important that's where share plan sits in my mind um so we've got that that we really want to crack on with and we think in early part of the next year to do that we've also just done an acquisition we've just taken um a um another company into the wincanton fold a company called signia logistics from pe so we're reversing the trend <laughs> so we brought <laughs> some private equity and we are very keen to offer that our share incentive plan to the signia employees very early on as part of the welcome to the Wincampton group. Um, probably, ironically, we're probably going to be able to do that quicker uh, than we're going to get to relaunch to our existing colleagues because they, um, they're they actually on a, a, a very stable payroll system at the moment. So we've signed off the deed of adherence. We did that yesterday. We did board meetings and everything to do that. Um, and we've literally just got to build the payroll feeds now to bring in the signal. So that is a real part of our employee engagement and employee benefits. Come to, to come to PLC World, we can give you a share plan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm there. I'm there. Really good news there. Yeah, absolutely. We also um, have got some Irish employees that we could not offer the SIP to before. Um, we're we're on with that one now as well, and we're just starting the implementation plan for for moving those into the share incentive plan. Uh, and hopefully, again over the next couple of months, we'll be able to offer that to our Irish employees. Only about 300 at the moment, but we are pushing our Irish business, so that is expected to grow. Um, and obviously we'll we'll follow that up with a full employee engagement campaign as well along the lines of the one that i've just talked about we're also yeah. uh, actually going to be hopefully launching a uh, save as you earn next year um so this time next year we've got that one penciled in the calendar to see if we can get that off the ground uh, we see that as a very important uh part of our offering to particularly the lower paid of our employees 
um, where you know there's not, not a great deal of risk with the save as you earn and it's easy to explain you know you, you don't have to buy the shares if you don't want to when you get to the end of your contract um, but it, it does tie in I, I mean we're we are facing real labor shortages at the moment it helps us with our retention of employees um, so you know, all in all it's, it's good news and it's going to keep me busy for the, the next few years I am also awesome. Secretary at, uh, at Wing Cancer, so this is just a little bit of a, an add-on. Um, you know, there's a team of people that will help me do that. So uh, yeah, we can have a busy time. Maybe. Definitely, and no, that's really, really good. Thanks for that, Lena. And one thing I'd add there is that if if there's one good thing that's come out of lockdown, it's probably this. So the fact that we can do webinars, uh, you know, we can do videos on phones, so we can actually get out to the people all around the UK that maybe in lorries, uh, you know, and and not. Uh, computers uh, and the great thing is just like this it can be recorded to webinar and you can save it onto the portal as well so there's some real good stuff there um free of charge as well but really engaging uh, and the other thing is the, the videos we used to spend three thousand pounds on doing an all singing all dancing video you know three four five years ago you know i'd have my hair done properly for it and everything i'd have my makeup on whereas now just get your phone out see a little message share saves come in sips come in or a testimonial from someone who's done it previously. So there you go. You can have those for free, Lynn. Like you have those. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. I mean, actually, those are very, very good points. And um, and one of the reasons why I was quite keen to get the senior management group, um, you know, into this scheme is because they can then cascade it down. They can be, you know, they can say, look, I did this two months ago, and look at what I've done. We we offer a um, you buy four, you get one free um, scheme. So it, it is quite valuable on the share incentive plan. And I, I'm just chomping at the bit to get out there and really market it. <laughs> Definitely. No, brilliant. And, uh, you know, I can tell you are passionate about it. You can probably tell I'm really passionate about our employees and, and exec yeah. plans as well. Uh, but, but moving on now to, to Colin's uh, passion, which is uh, EMI. I know they are used by um, over 10,000, I think I read, uh, companies uh, to really help emerging companies attract and keep top talent. Uh, Colin, I know. Um, like I said, this is something you really are passionate about. Can, can you explain to us in simple terms what an EMI is for the audience, first of all, though, please? Of course. So um, we act for lots of startups um, and companies that are venture backed all the way through to exit and all the way through uh, their journey. Um, what they're trying to do is attract key people uh, from relatively safer jobs to take the risk with them uh, in the hope that, you know, they'll achieve a successful exit and make a, a decent gain from it uh, and EMI is aimed at those sort of companies it's aimed at smaller companies with gross assets of less than 30 million and less than 250 employees uh, and it's uh, I mean, the problem they face is they haven't got the cash to pay large salaries and bonuses so the way to square the circle is offering equity and EMI just fits the bill fantastically because it's a discretionary option plan uh, with fantastic tax release that um, enables them to you know, um, uh, uh, offer really attractive incentives to people they want to recruit. So, you know, the tax rate, there's no tax on grant, no tax on exercise, assuming you set the strike price at market value. Uh, um, all the gains of taxes, capital, and the sale of the shares, and the business asset disposal relief rules are relaxed for EMI option holders. So, basically, after, if they sell their shares more than two years after grant, uh, they qualify for the 10% tax rate in the first million of lifetime gains. So, in short, in short terms, what Small companies are able to offer people to entice them is an option which will give them a 10% tax rate on the first million of gains to those stage of exit. That's, that's the typical one they use. But it, 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 they don't have to be exit only, they can be used. Um, you can allow people to exercise pre exit, and that can help to, if you're trying to shift ownership towards employees, and that's a very useful tool for that and you know, various other uses. But the bread and butter is exit only plans, uh, and it's enables small companies to entice. You know, and then the other thing that's really attractive about them, it's the icing on the cake, if you like, is that the, the employing company gets a corporation tax deduction uh, equal to the spread when the options are exercised. Uh, so typically, when options are exercised just before completion, and that is um, accounted for as a deferred tax asset. And the purchaser will often give credit for it pound for pound uh, in the purchase price. So, you know, at a very small cash cost of putting in the plan in the first place, at no risk for participants, they own it with the 10% tax rate and the company ends up with an enhanced purchase price um, by putting in the plan. So it is, it's fantastic. And it's, you know, the, the thing newsworthy about it recently is, is the uh, the figures that HMRC published, don't they, for the take up of plans. And um, 
EMI has now outstripped the cost of all other plans with its checker, which is a really interesting watermark. And, and just think about that for a minute. That's because the EMI is offered to venture bank smaller companies. It's really a testament to the success of the venture capital industry and how fantastically successful those smaller businesses have been. Um, but they are delivering now certain gains that outstrip, you know, the listed companies that offer the share savings to uh, a vast amount of employees. Uh, they, they, so they're hard won games, if you like, and they're a testament to younger company success. There you go. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Perfect. And. Uh... I think uh, we, we were all worrying that something uh, would come up in the budget around EMI. I know there's, it's been on the back burner. What, what, where do you see the future going with it? Do you think there's going to be changes imminent? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a really important issue. This. So the Office of Tax Simplification did uh, two reports, didn't they, on um, capital gains tax. Uh, and the, the main um, thrust of it was to align the rates of capital gains tax with income tax and to cut the size of the annual exemption and if both of those two things happened uh, it would be uh, an absolute disaster for tax qualified employee share plans uh, i mean there'll be virtually no point in doing a share save plan because the, the whole point the whole benefit currently is that uh, people are able to use their annual exemptions to uh, reduce the gain or often in many cases pay no gain at all and they'd suddenly be paying gains at income tax rates uh, and for EMI, it would be a disaster too. I mean, if they also got rid of the business asset disposal relief, um, then uh, it would render EMI pointless too. And so it's a, it's a huge issue for uh, for venture capital. And, and, and of course, the other thing that might well go if they uh, did that was to get rid of the, the EIS and SEIS tax reliefs. And in my experience over the last 20 years, and we act for so many venture-backed companies, we know this, um, wealthy individuals are enticed to put money into high-risk companies through EIS and SEIS. And they're enticed to do that because there's no capital gains tax uh, if you hold the shares in for three or five years in those those vehicles. So to, to abolish those reliefs and say that they have to be taxed at income would have an absolutely devastating consequence uh, for venture funding and for smaller companies to try and attract key people into, into the business. I mean, it couldn't happen. They would not have the cash to do it. Uh, and there's there's no easy alternative if you scrap the tax relief on, on options or you know, render it useless by uh, equalising the rates. So it, it's, a, it's a huge issue and it keeps coming up. And, and, and the odd thing is, um, you know, it, it's happened to this, you know, the, the last budget, the government was very silent about it. And this the awesome statement that was silent about it. But in both cases, we had a lot of clients that were trying to complete MA deals in advance of the budget or the awesome statement because they were panicking uh, that these rates are going to be equalised. And if they're not, it'd be awfully helpful for the government to just say, no, we're not going to do anything about it, rather than just keeping completely silent, because at the moment we're under under tender hooks. Brilliant. No, thanks for that. Great stuff, Colin. Uh, we've also got questions coming in, which is wonderful to see. Um, Lynn, you're the hot topic here. Everyone wants to know what you're up to. So, first of all, Tom uh, Parker. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, as part of the SIP relaunch, are you also considering changing your offering? Uh, varying the levels of the match or introducing free shares um, to try and improve take up. Is there anything you're thinking about? Yeah, we were thinking about offering a, a free share award as, as part of the launch, you know, really to thank everybody for the um, for the support really through the lockdown. Because uh, as I say, a lot of our employees have been working really long hours and um, the role has sort of expanded quite quite quickly for them um, and also with the resource uh, challenge that we've got at the moment we are really calling on our employees to work longer hours um, but unfortunately when we looked at it it was going to cost us a little bit too much we're a very low margin business um, and we are, we also operate a lot of open book contracts um, and we didn't think we'd get anything back uh, from our from our customers to, to help us you know try and swallow that cost so we looked at it and we thought, mm, actually, we can't really do that. Um, we would have loved to, because it would have been a really great message, wouldn't it? Um, but uh, no, unfortunately. Uh, and the four for one, uh, sorry, one for four uh, offer that we've got, I think actually, you know, that that's fairly, fairly generous anyway. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd, I wouldn't, I'd never think of reducing it, but um, I think to increase it would also be quite costly for us. Yeah, the only uh, the only way I've seen companies doing the past, Lynn, is uh, rather than doing the, the the match on all the monies, maybe on the first twenty pound you get a one for one match, so that the cost to the company is not any more, uh, but it's it's more uh, to engage with with your lower earners, so that they're making the yeah. one match. So that's uh, 
Uh, bit so of free yeah, advice there, Darren. So yeah, I'll there. take that. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure that's what Tom had said as well. So, uh, no, that's great. And there is one other question as well. Now, I think it's from uh, Mariam Lamar. So, thank you very much. Can you tell us about the challenges of choosing a management solution? So, I think that's where you've taken it from in house into um, a new provider. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of cheated there because I'd used the share provider in a previous role and I knew that they could offer me, you know, the, um, the full. Uh, full service effectively. I, I must um, have been on holiday when you made that call to the new providers, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the trouble is, I mean, we were we were very much um, wanting to have the same uh, new registrar as share provider, um, because for me it makes it a lot easier to manage. Uh, so that does limit who we go to there, Darren. <laughs> But, you, but I, I suppose, you, you know, I mean, it, it is all about a little bit of a partnership, uh, getting a partnership going. We did undertake a full RFP. We did do a full, uh, you know, ex tender exercise. Um, and the share provider we chose wasn't the cheapest, but could offer us more in terms of a packaged approach. And it, to me, it's a, true, it's a true relationship. If I've got problems, I can go to them and say, look, I'm may not be able to pay you for this just yet but um could you offer this and then we can look at something else in the future uh and it works that way because it's a bit of a win-win great stuff no thanks for that then uh, any more questions people just feel free to send them in to us uh we'll uh, make them as challenging as possible if we can't answer it we'll come back to you um so moving back to to Shara, um what challenges are your clients currently seeing um, sorry could you repeat that Sorry, I'm just saying, what challenges are you seeing uh, your clients bring to you at the moment? What are the frequent questions, issues that, that they're having? Yeah, I mean, I think um, like Lindstein, um, there's quite a lot of clients thinking about how to reward employees after the pandemic. And I am hoping that we'll see more take up of, um, well, not necessarily more take up, but some more relaunches of SIP and SAYE schemes. Um, I know that like Lynn, there's a lot of them. Um, listed companies out there who do feel like their employees have really come through for them during the pandemic and who do want to um, you know spread the rewards for that a bit um, so making those work um, is I think one of the challenges we're seeing is that a lot of the plans we're working on are more in international than before there's a lot of um, participants in jurisdictions sometimes where um, share funds just aren't really a familiar concept um, Asia um, even um, some African countries sometimes um, and so making seeing how to make it work um, in those jurisdictions is really interesting um, it does take a fair bit of thought um, sometimes um, you do see just a cash mirror plan and you know a lot of respect for that it is more expensive than, than using shares but um, it is simpler and it does mean your employees are still getting the benefit um, I think as Colin touched on we're also seeing a bit of um, with all these sales to private equity um, it's not the private equity doesn't want to put in share plans um, they're really keen on anything that incentivizes their employees um, you know it would be I'm not under an illusion that all these companies are putting in share plans just out of the pure goodness of their hearts they do it because it's good for them too you know if you have employees who are happy and who feel like they're rewarded well for their work you know they do better work for you um, and the EMI doesn't work for um, private equity backed companies and for the bigger ones um, unfortunately SAYE is just unworkable it sits you would have to use shares in the parent company and again that just doesn't really work because it's not really linked to the entity employees are actually working for so it's a tricky problem because using shares in a subsidiary company is not allowed for most tax advantage schemes for some very good reasons um, it's quite tricky to work with um, but I do hope it's something where we'll see more thought going into how you might be able to make it work and maybe I'm um, opening that up a bit the company the you know especially companies like Morrison's employees are doing the same job for the same company but the ownership has changed and that means you can't do, run, run the same share plans anymore. Okay. No thank you Charlotte um, really insightful and then uh, Colin uh, just going back to the budget we uh, you mentioned CGT 
um, you know, was talked about at the same time as EMI. Where do you think that's do you think that's going to come back anytime soon? What what does the future look like? Well, as I said, we've all been on tender hooks for the budget and the autumn statement now, following the Office of Tax Simplifications you know, report. Um, and there's been complete silence from the government on both occasions. Uh, and I mean, I do remember back in, there was a big panic about green shares about six or seven years ago, and the government were looking into it and they asked practitioners like us how they worked, and they were gathering lots of information. And there was lots of speculation that we're going to somehow legislate or block them or make the valuation more tricky. And then we just got complete silence and now everyone's forgotten about it. So I, I suppose the best we can hope for, well, you know, it'd be nice if the government did say we're not going to do anything about the OT, OTS's report. But I mean, if they're not going to say that, I suppose the best we've got to look forward to is complete silence until we've all forgotten about it. Um, but but <laughs> if they actually did anything about it, it would be a, a, a complete, I mean, it would really would you know, turn our world upside down because um, most of the tax plans rely on, you know, the difference between capital and income and the fact that capital is much more attractively taxed. And if you just remove that, it, it does mean that companies won't able to use equity very effectively to attract them. When there was a brief period, wasn't there, under Nigel Lawson from 1998 to 94, I think, when uh, the CGT rates and income tax rates were aligned, and it was still better to have tax qualified plans marginally uh, because uh, you avoided national insurance contributions and the annual exemption, where it was a lot lower than, was still a meaningful amount. So it meant that share save was still feasible and you know relatively attractive then. But if you both uh, get align the rates and get rid of the or massively reduce the annual exemption, which is what was proposed by the ATS, it, you know that would be a, an absolute disaster. So where do I? Well, I, I don't know, I'm just hoping I've got no great insight on, on what the government's actually thinking. But I hope I hope they realise. Um, that it would be a disaster for, for our area anyway, and don't do anything about it. Okay. And was there anything else from the budget that's worth uh, noting on today's uh, oh, webinar? Well, the other thing, it's not particularly, um, well, yes, there's two things actually in the budget. But first of all, although it was announced before the um, uh, um, awesome statement, is, is the NHS levy, um, which, uh, you know, you increase the increase national insurance rate from 2% to 3.25%, in effect, that's what it does. Uh, and the employer's national insurance rate is added by another one, of course, it is over 15%. So that makes uh, non-qualifying plans even less attractive than they are currently, and consequently, tax qualifying more attractive. You know, if you do the maths and you pass on the employer's NIC and NHS levy, the effective tax rate for additional tax rate payer goes up from 54% to over 58%. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, people are already horrified by 54%, so 58 makes it even slightly more horrific. So, uh, consequently, share, you know, qualifying share plans are more attractive, as are great shares now, other alternatives that give you capital treatment. So, that was one thing uh, from the budget statement or just before. The other thing we're all waiting for is, is the response to the, uh, the government's response to the request for. Uh, information on EMI because um, the premise of that consultation process was to improve EMI. You know, um, they wanted to look at the, co the companies that qualify, see if we expand the categories. They wanted to look at all the, the traps and the legislation which we keep coming across in M&A deals. And you know, you have very unfortunate consequences for option holders that, for no reason, um, you know, it's not their fault that these various conditions are have been failed. It's because companies uh, haven't realised, and it often isn't their fault either. So, you know, there, there are lots of traps in the legislation that. We have lobbied on we, we as part of the um, ESOP Centre's um, uh, submissions, and, and we've we drafted. You know, these are long-running things that have happened with EMI, and we've drafted them in, in the hope that the government will respond and improve it. Uh, so uh, that is something that we were kind of hoping we would, would hear from in the autumn statement, we haven't? But you know, let, let's hope let's hope they'd like to respond. Brilliant. No, thank you, Colin. Um, and I think we've got time for maybe one more question. If anyone's got a question out there, feel free to, to put it in the question box. Um, but Lynn, um, you obviously told us about the uh, exec plans where you've brought them from the spreadsheet to uh, uh, onto a, a platform now. Have you changed them up in any other way? Is there anything else uh, where you've, you've looked at changing or you're looking at changing in the future on the exec plan side? Because we've talked a lot about the uh, all employee. Yeah, I think we, we are looking at um, different uh, arrangements. Um, so at the moment, we've only got a long term incentive plan, and that's a, a very flexible plan. Uh, does allow restricted shares. So that's one of the, the things that we could look at. 
Um, we think our shareholders, our investors, would probably be quite, um, they'd be quite happy with us moving towards something like a restricted share plan because we do have problems, not have, not have problems with, um, you know, sort of like knowing where the business is going, but setting targets. You know, you can be, they, they can have very unfortunate um, outcomes um, and restricted shares sort of take that away a little, a little bit. But um, we understand that investors would expect um, a restricted share award to be a lot less than a long term incentive plan award would be. So um, we can offer up to 100 uh, percent for our, for our 100 percent of annual salary for our um, directors, executive directors. For a restricted share plan, it would be up to 50% uh, that we'd be looking at. But of course, you know, you take away some of those targets and it's still a really good uh, retention tool. Um, so, you know, that's something that we could look at. Um, we don't, we're not in a policy, a remuneration policy year this year. So if we're gonna do anything, it would be next uh, financial year. Um, and, and things are playing out in the market. It seems like investors are much more amenable to, to different solutions now for um, long-term incentive, in, uh, incentive arrangements. Um, so it's definitely one that's on the radar with the remuneration committee in our organisation. Brilliant. Okay, well, that brings us to the, uh, the end of our time. I'd like to thank you three for being absolute superstars and answering everything that's been thrown at you. Um, all that's left for me to do as well is to thank all our sponsors uh, that make these events possible. Uh, to Juliet behind the scenes, keeping flicking those uh, screens for us, which is fabulous. Thank you very much, Juliet. And also to you, the audience. Uh, there's there's a few that I keep seeing joining us every time, so you must be happy with my dad jokes. Uh, apologies, uh, that they don't get any better. But have a wonderful day, and uh, hope to see you all again in 2022. I can't believe it's going to be 2022 soon. So um, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, all the very best. See you later. Thank you. Thank you.